Hey there, welcome back to the kitchen for another episode of What's Cooking at the Capitol with me, Adam. Uh, I am Adam Mason, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the State Policy Organizing Director at Iowa CCI Action Fund. I want to thank you for joining me today uh, on yet another episode of What's Cooking at the Capitol. Today we're going to be talking uh, later on about democracy, about uh, participatory democracy specifically, and, and why not just voting, uh, but really getting your hands dirty and, and uh, you know, uh, helping make the sausage, so to speak, is a critical part of our dem democratic processes. Uh, we're going to recap what's been going on at the Capitol this week. We're going to dig in on democracy, like I said, and then we'll give you a quick look ahead at, at next week. But first, uh, you might notice that uh, I'm wearing an apron today that spotlights my favorite football team. I know it's a big football weekend. I, I totally understand if not everybody digs football. Uh, it's been something I've been wrestling with in terms of, you know, the just the, the trauma that players have to deal with, concussions, uh, and of course, the exploitation of, of young students, especially in college football. Uh, but, you know, I still uh, watch the Packers, and I'm a little bit disappointed they're not in the Super Bowl this weekend. That's why today on What's Cooking at the Capitol, we're going to be making beer cheese soup. I'll be enjoying it on Sunday as I, uh, you know, watch all of those great uh, capitalistic commercials. But um, the thing about my beer cheese soup is... Uh, I like to have it a little bit chunky, so it's not just not just beer cheese. Uh, it is got some vegetables in it. So I've already chopped some peppers, some carrots, some onions, um, and some celery. Uh, and that's just going to go right here into a hot pan where we're going to sauté it for a few minutes. The other thing is, you know, uh, sometimes what's going on at the Capitol be enough to drive you to drink. So the nice thing about this recipe is. Uh, the beer that we're going to use is a nice light beer. Um, we're going to use about two cups of beer. You can switch up the beer. Cooking with beer is fun. I like to use stout or, or porter sometimes in chilies. Today I'm just using a light beer. Uh, you can use something hoppy if you like a little more bitter in your beer cheese soup. But uh, mm, this is a grain belt going out to Mark Schultz. Speaking of folks from, from around the state, just give a couple quick shout outs to uh, what's, what's Cooking viewers. I uh, heard from a friend I haven't heard from in a while up in Alaska, um, Mary Marisa, Maria, uh, saying hi to you out in Washington, and of course to all of our CCI friends and supporters across the state. We had a big week at the Capitol, lots of movement on, uh, on um, committee bills, uh, committee, so lots of subcommittee and committee bills moving. Of course, yesterday we had some snow here uh, across Iowa. That fortunately sent legislators home a little bit early and now the temperatures are dropping with the polar vortex. So no action today at the Capitol. Uh, a quick update on a bill we talked about last week, the bill to uh, promote school voucher, public, public vouchers to move public money into private education. That bill stalled a little bit this week. We've heard back from a lot of you who took action. So thank you for doing that, that, uh, that there's actually looking at some amendments or breaking this bill up into pieces. Now our message remains the same. We cannot be moving public money into private schools. Uh, so keep taking action, but it's working. Just want to give you a quick update there. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that, uh, you know, um, leaders have been kind of like signaling rumors. We're going to talk about uh, redistricting at the end of the show today, because uh, I know redistricting is on a lot of your minds. Um, but leaders, legislative leaders are really trying to move very, very fast at the Capitol and um, to prevent a COVID outbreak, right? Uh, the Republican leadership, and specifically Pat Grassley, has has uh, resisted having legislators wear masks. In fact, he's gone so far as to say he can't enforce a mask mandate. Where have we heard that before? Governor Kim Reynolds. Uh, however, you know what's funny is a shout out to Representative Beth wessel Crichel, who made a stand this week. Uh, there are House rules that, that dictate what's, what legislators have to wear. Uh, Representative wessel Crichel wore jeans, and apparently that's against the rules. Well, you know what? If they can enforce uh, clothing uh, rules, it seems like they sure as hell can, can uh, enforce a mask mandate. So a shout out to Representative Wessel Crichel. And a real quick update on COVID. Uh, the governor held a press conference yesterday. We still haven't seen any bills uh, providing COVID relief for our communities. Um, nothing that's addressing uh, the, the spread, nothing to, you know, to make sure that our communities are getting the resources they need. And in fact, Governor Reynolds was, uh, was briefing the state yesterday on the vaccine rollout. Um, this is rather unfortunate because it, it kind of appeared to us like there's no plan for making sure that vaccines are rolled out. This shows itself in the numbers. 
Um, Iowa right now is ranked 47th uh, out of 50, obviously, per capita in terms of our vaccine rate. Uh, and uh, we're down there around 46, 47 in terms of our testing rate, too. So we're not testing enough. We're not wearing masks. And we don't have a plan to get the vaccine out there. Uh, this is a problem, something we need to address moving forward. Uh, another bill just that I want to spotlight real quick is a bill that we fought last year. It's a bill to take away local control um, from communities that want to make sure that public housing is available to all people. Uh, this bill would preempt those ordinances. This is uh, Senate Study Bill 1079. Uh, it did pass the Senate last year, but we stopped it in the House. Uh, so we're hopeful we're going to keep resisting that bill this year. Real quick, I'm just going to stir in some flour into a little bit of butter I've got going here. And uh, just to get a roux started before I bring on my special guest today. So today we are very fortunate to have Monte Muhammad from Des Moines BLM joining us. Uh, Monte is a, a powerful organizer here in, in central Iowa. Monte, so glad to have you here today. Thanks for having me on. Uh, he him pronouns. Did you say polar vortex earlier? I did, I did. So that's why is that is that thing gonna keep coming back? Is that a recurring theme in our lives? I'm too young for this day. Right. Ah, that's crazy. Time to, time to do something about climate change because yeah, the high that we're looking at is uh, barely above zero for the next week. Um, well, Monte, again, thank you for joining me so much. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to focus on today was democracy, the democratic processes, and getting people uh, radicalized. So. We've seen a number of bills to crack down on protesters at the Capitol this year. Uh, it's, it's something that legislators have been cooking up before. We've seen this. It isn't new. We saw it in the wake of the DAPL, Dakota Access Pipeline protests, a few years ago that Indigenous folks let us in here across the state. But I think what's striking this year is the number of bills that seem to be retaliating against protests, uh, against police violence, and in support of BLM last summer. We've seen this across the country. We're seeing it here in Iowa. Bills criminalizing the use of laser pointers. Uh, bills criminalizing using bikes or skateboards as part of a protest. Uh, making it tougher penalties if, if protesters go in the street. Uh, at the same time, these bills actually make it okay for people to drive through protests. And we've seen this happen in other, other states as well. Why do you think we're seeing an increase in these attempts to criminalize dissent, to criminalize protest? especially targeting black organizers? Um, I think um, the first thing we got to realize is, um, and we like a big theme of last fall was uh, getting Trump out of office and making that a, a moral mission, right? And so now getting Trump out of office is a moral mission. We have to understand that that, that is not finished. Um, and, even, and even getting Trump out of office isn't, isn't necessarily the ultimate uh, moral uh, mission because we understand Trump is a huge obstacle in the in the path towards liberation for black people and subsequently you know indigenous and all people but um trump is still in the iowa state house he runs it i mean he himself runs it through kim reynolds um and through the iowa uh, the the republican party um and so when we look at the protests and why they're cracking down on them i think you got right to it which is that um they're they're black like they're, this is the first time in um probably 50 or 60 years that black people in the state of Iowa have had a, a, a unified voice, um, a political agenda, demands, clear demands, clear organization, um, and have mapped out new effective tactics. And when we look at effective tactics, I think they give away to us <laughs> a lot of the tactics that they thought they didn't want to mess with no more. You know what I mean? Like they don't want to mess with people on skateboards and like, but how is that illegal? You know what I mean? These are streets, these are public streets. Um, or, you know, when we talk about um, some of the unconstitutional uh, aspects of the, the back the blue bill, when we talk about uh, sentencing people to 24 hours in jail just for being charged with a crime, that's extremely dangerous. That means we're in a world if that bill gets passed where they could snatch a protester, charge them with something not bring them before the court of law and by law be able to hold them for 24 hours mandated with no evidence yet being submitted while evidence is being submitted and gathered while testimonies are being gathered before they've had the chance to see the judge before they've had a chance to bond out before they've had a chance to speak to a lawyer they've already been sentenced just when they've been charged that's unconstitutional 
Um, we also have an aspect of that bill that says you can't disrespect the flag or use the flag. That's not constitutional. That's just not constitutional. We've already, we've, we did Tinker versus Bell in this state, in this city. You know what I'm saying? So it, it really doesn't make any sense. Um, except for the fact that, um, as Sally Frank kind of said, and we talked about this before the show, but we was talking about the um, Des Moines Register article where Sally Frank said, I've never seen the police act this way. Um, and now we're saying we've never seen the legislator act this way. And both times, the other thing that we said we've never seen is a movement this organized and effective and young and black. Um, and so I think it just comes down to that, like, they don't want to deal with us. And I think, like, just on a personal on a personal tip, like, if I was Kim Reynolds, if I was the Iowa Republican Party, and I seen us and the talent and the youth and the potential and the longevity, the potential for longevity and have to deal with this group as a real force and a real lobby forever, <laughs> like, indefinitely, as just, I, I wouldn't know what to do either. I might lose my mind, too. No, that's right. That's right. I'm, I'm, I want to come back to the back to the blue thing in, in just a second, but you're absolutely right. And, you know, going back to last summer, the 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 protests against police violence that you all were leading up in central Iowa, that that uh, folks in Iowa City and Cedar Rapids were raising up. It truly was a statewide movement, too. We saw folks even in, in places like Hardin Corning County, like Eldora, Iowa, a small town of twenty five hundred people. Folks showing up on the town square to support BLM. Yeah, uh, they know that this is a powerful movement. Mm -hmm. and, you know, on that, Governor Reynolds has really become an expert at talking out of both sides of her mouth. I was talking about her COVID response. We've seen it during the pandemic, but I was surprised this week when when Governor Reynolds had her bill introduced to combine efforts to address racial profiling. She says that she's trying to ban the practice of racial profiling statewide, but she combined that with with a lot of the stuff that we see in these back the blue. Uh, bills. Um, and it, it really, what it does is it takes away the local control of our communities to decide our own city and county budgets. Um, yeah. What's, what's really going on here? Um, so that's the thing is I don't think Kim is an expert at speaking out of both sides of her mouth. I think she tries it. I think it is her main tactic. I don't think she's very good at it. And I think that's why she, you know, really fails to get significant legislation passed ever that she leads on. Um, and she fails to, uh, you know, have a good approval rating. She doesn't really get anything done. And it's because she's not good at this deceptive tactic that she tries. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty clear. Like when you read the bill, it's very clear that almost all of the language of these eight pages is about protesting. And that there's one section of the bill that says that officers can't treat di people disparately. You don't define what disparately means. You don't define the, uh, uh, the the enforcement measures. You don't define the sentencing. You don't define what anything else. You just say, by law, officers aren't supposed to do this. You don't say what code to refer if they do. You don't say who's gonna who's gonna uh, be responsible if we're gonna do community overwatch for this. If we're gonna have any kind of uh, what does racial profiling mean? Are there specific laws that we're gonna target to de enforce? It's not a plan. It's it's words is words and we speak out of both sides of your mouth you're supposed to convey an entire plan to both sides and what she's conveying to the republican party and to the racist elements of iowa is we're going after him like you asked That's and right. what she's saying to us is you're gonna have to take it and we're not going to um and it's also interesting um another i don't know of a point that uh you guys may have seen but with the naacp said in the article, oh, I think the, the racial, to put all this other stuff with the racial profiling ban, the bill is, it makes the bill a poison pill. And then Betty Andrews said, and Betty's trying to teach Kim how to speak out of both sides of her mouth. She said, this bill would be better if it were broken into two bills. Hmm. So Jalen says to me, you know, if that bill was broken into two bills, which would pass and get signed by Kim Reynolds and which would. And so, that's what we have to look at is like, and Lynn Ta, uh, uh, who used to write for the Des Moines Register, um, quoted the article and said, I think it's interesting that um, uh, Betty Andrews said that this was a poison pill, but last year just worked publicly in, in Grinnell to say that a lynching wasn't racially motivated. You know what I mean? And that was the same um, representative that met us at the table and told us there's a process for voting, selling voting rights. And lo and behold, seven months or however months later it was, it wasn't seven months, it felt like it. We got it. 
You know what I mean? Because they're tired. They're just absolutely tired. And now that's why we have this bill. That's right. That's right. So there's there's a lot that we have to do to stop these these bad bills. Uh, what can people do to, to radicalize themselves? Mm. I think that, so for me, radicalization comes from like a deep, like spiritual primordial place. I always say read. And by read, I don't mean just uh, just reading books, but I mean like um, synthesize information, synthesize the world. You know, listen to music, meditate, listen to your partner. You know what I mean? Feel your partner. Take an extra moment to to observe life, read life, process life. And then when we're as we're doing that, we're looking to read about blackness, right? And we're looking to read about black queer people, the people that we never see, the people we wonder about. You know, the people that are back in the crevices of our imagination. You know, the Audre Lords um, and the Angela Davises and the Malcolm X's and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that that for me, once you do that, naturally the movement, I can't tell people what to do in their lives because I can't live your life. You know what I mean? But I could tell you that you need to be inspired every day. And that's that's you know, that's how I keep going. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monte. Those are inspiring words uh, for folks to take to heart. Uh, and appreciate you taking time today to join us and to shed some light on what's going on, what's cooking in for capital. Hey, appreciate you. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, on those notes, that's uh, Monte's got some some great guidance there. Uh, and one of the bills that that Monte mentioned was something that we saw last year, and ultimately that Governor Reynolds responded to the power of protest by signing an executive order to restore the voting rights for returning citizens, for folks that have done their time and that are coming out of the criminal justice system to make sure that they could vote last fall. She did that because of the power of protest. Uh, we know that that's a short-term fix though, and that what we really need is a constitutional amendment. Um, it's, it's something that the House uh, of Representatives passed last year, but that hasn't gone through the Senate. We've got two bills uh, that would actually do that for us that we need to support. House Study Bill 143, House File 136 would, would get that constitutional amendment process rolling. That's critical to making sure that all Iowans have the right to vote, that every vote is counted and every vote counts. Um, uh, when we talk about voting uh, and democracy, one of the big things on our mind this year, obviously, is, is redistricting. Uh, you know, and, and you might be asking, why are we talking so much about democracy today? Well, democracy is kind of like it's, it's the essential ingredient to everything that we're cooking, right? Um, and uh, speaking of which, I'm going to go ahead and add my beer to the vegetables I've got frying now. I've got a roux over here going. Um, I'm going to slowly put the cheese in there to get that melty. Uh, and, and really, you know, it's that meltiness that, that brings our democracy together, that, that makes it all work. Part of that is redistricting. So uh, it's, it's that time of, of the decade uh, every year is when we get the census uh, returned and we use that information to uh, redistrict uh, our, our voting districts across the state. Now, unfortunately, the census, as you probably know, was tied up because of the Trump administration. Um, so we are late in getting that census data back to the state. Now, Iowa has the model redistricting process uh, for, the, for the country. It's considered the gold standard. We use a nonpartisan um, board that draws the lines, doesn't look at, at partisan uh, or voter registration numbers, just looks at population, draws what they try to do as much as possible of straight lines without breaking up counties or cities, uh, unless, of course, the population requires that. And again, that, that doesn't allow for the gerrymandering that we've seen in, in some, some other states. Uh, usually it's, it's an up or down vote um, to the legislature and then the, the governor has an opportunity to either sign or veto that. It can come back for a second vote if they don't approve, uh, which has happened. And it's on the third vote that legislators can actually start messing with those, those district lines themselves. Now there is a judicial review process if it makes it to that third vote, but we're hopeful that it hasn't. Now, because we're late in getting this census data, uh, we are anticipating, again, legislators to kind of cut out early to prevent the pandemic from hitting the Capitol again. Uh, when they get the budget information in March, they're gonna run like heck to try and get that, that budget passed. They'll adjourn the session and come back for a special session to deal with redistricting. So that's something that we're anticipating happening in June, July is, is a special legislative session to, to get these voting districts figured out. But what's really giving me hope today uh, is, is not what's cooking here in Iowa, but it's what is, is really starting to bubble up at, at the U.S. Congress. 
Um, we are seeing uh, an effort move forward at, in Congress at the federal level for HR1 and S1. Um, these are called the For the People Act. And the fact that uh, the, the new Congress has given these the first bill introduction numbers means that it really is their number one priority. Um, it'll do three things. And, and, and this is stuff that we've been fighting for here in Iowa at CCI Action uh, since the mid 2000s um, and actually regaining some of the, the rights that we've lost. Uh, HR, uh, H, HR1 and SR1 would protect and expand voting rights. Uh, they would give us programs like automatic voter registration. It would, uh, we have same day registration, but it would allow also for online voter registration. Um, it would expand early voting. You know, last, uh, the last two years, we've seen a, a, a window close on those early vet, uh, voting deadlines. It would restore some of those. It prohibits voter purges. Uh, you know, that's something we've seen here in Iowa. And it would extend the model that we have here in Iowa for redistricting around the country. It would prevent gerrymandering, which we know is a big problem. Even more exciting, and, and Susie Peter, if you're watching, I know you're going to be happy about this. Uh, it's going to help us reduce the influence of big money in our politics. Um, it's, it's going to require that a lot of these shady secret money groups, you know, super PACs and PACs that, that do all of the attack ads, uh, they're going to have to disclose their donors, uh, which is going to shine a light on where this money is actually coming from and who's trying to influence our democratic process. And it would actually start to uh, create a small donor focused public financing system so that everyday folks like you or me can run for office. You don't have to be a millionaire or a billionaire just to run for office. That's really, really exciting. The last thing that this set of reforms will do uh, is really just, you know, ensure an ethical government. Um, it, it's going to kind of close that revolving door uh, that, you know, where lo legislators become lobbyists and back and forth and a lot of those um, uh, relationships. It's going to expand the conflict of interest laws, and it's going to give us stronger rules uh, around ethics um, that we need in our capital. So what we're really excited about is, is HR1 at the federal level, because um, it's, it's going to help us really start cooking with gas uh, when it comes to democracy. Looking ahead at next week to find out what's cooking at the Capitol, uh, we've got a big week of action planned for you. As you know, one of the big issues that we fight for uh, is, is uh, uh, family farms and clean water at CCI. Next week, we've got a week-long week of action plan for you. Um, you can uh, RSVP right there at that link to join us next week. Monday, we're going to be kicking it off with a great live stream. Tuesday, we've got a press conference with some of our legislative sponsors and a big rally that you don't want to miss. It's going to be exciting. We're going to hear some uh, awesome community members about why they're supporting a moratorium on factory farms. Wednesday night, we're going to do a lobby training. If you've ever uh, felt, you know, wanted to get better at telling your story and contacting legislators, join us Wednesday night to get trained up on that because then Thursday, we're going to put you to work, contacting your legislators with a call-in day. Uh, and then Friday, you can join me right back here in the kitchen for what's cooking at the Capitol. Uh, when we'll recap our week of action. I want to go back to the, the beer cheese soup before I send you off today. Uh, a little bit of salt, cayenne, and some pepper. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and measure off some milk to add to my roux um, to get that going. What I'm going to do then is I'm just going to end up, once I get all my cheese melted, I'm going to add the vegetable and beer mixture in there. We'll let that simmer for about a half hour. And uh, I tell you what, Sunday when it's cold outside, uh, I'm going to be sitting on the couch watching commercials and eating, enjoying some beer cheese too. So thanks for joining me on What's Cooking at the Capitol today. Sign up for our emails if you want more information or you're looking for ways to take action. You'll get an email from us uh, providing easy to use action alerts. Send your legislator an email, give them a phone call, uh, and we'll give you a breakdown of the bills that we're tracking here at CCI Action. Thank you again for joining me on What's Cooking at the Capitol. Until next week, stay fed.